Welcome everyone. Thank you very much for coming along to uh, the, I think it's fifth talk in our current season, which, yeah, is that about right? <laughs> which is looking at uh, concepts and ideas around consciousness, um, psychology and technology. Uh, and we're really pleased today to have um, Professor Lackey, Jennifer, uh, joining us from Northwestern University, which is just north of Chicago. Uh, I believe, Jennifer. So this is one of the ways we're, we're taking advantage of our complex hybrid setup as managed by the, the long-suffering uh, Robin over here uh, by having speakers from you know, around the world uh, joining us. Um, but we're really, really grateful uh, to Jennifer for making the time to do this. Uh, I should remind you all that we will be recording the talk. Uh, so if you're saying anything embarrassing please go on mute until the q a when of course any any embarrassing questions are very welcome and do also bear in mind uh if you're joining us on video that you are probably on our screen here even if uh, just tucked away in the corner so just uh factor that into your calculations about what you're doing um jennifer lackey is the Wayne and Elizabeth Jones Professor of Philosophy at Northwestern, uh, also Director of the Northwestern Prison Education Program, uh, President of the Central Division of the American Philosophical Association, Editor-in-Chief of Philosophical Studies and Episteme, Episte, Episte yeah, something like that, Epist uh, a journal on epistemology, let's say. Um, and most of uh, Professor Lackey's research is in the area of social epistemology, uh, focusing on issues at the intersection of epistemology and the criminal legal system. Um, she has won the Dr. Martin R. Leibowitz and Eve Llewellyn Leibowitz Prize for Philosophical Achievement and Contribution, as well as the Young Epistemologist Prize and many other grants and fellowships. So an extremely uh, illustrious speaker, and we're delighted to have you here uh, with us, um, Professor Lackey or Jennifer, if I may. Um, and we're going to hear a little bit about uh, eyewitness testimony, testimony today. Um, and Jennifer writes that it's a powerful form of evidence, and this is especially true in the United States criminal legal system and of course uh, ours here in the UK. At the same time, eyewitness misidentification is the greatest contributing factor to wrongful convictions proven by DNA testing. So in this talk, we're gonna hear a close examination of the tension between the enormous weight, uh, epistemic weight that eyewitness testimony is afforded in the criminal legal system and the fact that there are important questions about its reliability as a source of evidence. So I think a really interesting sort of high stakes issue of applied uh, philosophy. So um, Jennifer, we'll ask you to talk for um, up to 40 minutes. So about 8.15 or 2.15, I think for you, I'm not totally sure, but 40 minutes from now. Uh, and then we'll open up to questions, which I will chair and we'll take those from the room but also from people online, and I will uh, do my best to coordinate all of that. So, um, Jennifer, thank you again for joining us. We're really grateful um, to you for doing this, and over to you. Of course, thank you so much for having me. Um, so I um, just wanna, I always say this when I'm working off my laptop, I have the, my screen, um, is very small, so I can't see any of the images of the people. So if you need to get my attention, um, just please unmute yourself and let me know um, because I can't see the chat or anything. I just see my slides on my screen. Um, so thank you again for having me. Um, this, uh, the talk that I'm gonna give today is part of a broader project that I'm working on, a book project. Um, and during the q and I'm happy to tell you a little bit about how I apply the framework that I'm gonna develop today to other phenomena, um, such as confession evidence, um, the plea deal process, um, recantations from like domestic violence uh, survivors and so on. So there's a, the framework that I'm gonna be developing today has a lot of um, very concrete applications um, in the criminal legal system, but today I'm gonna be talking about eyewitness identifications. 
Um, so eyewitness testimony and my expertise is in the United States criminal legal system, but I know that there are some similarities with the UK system. You guys, to the extent that we diverge, um, many of the um, ways in which we diverge is to your benefit. Um, but uh, much of what I say today, I think will apply um, to, to many um, criminal legal systems. So um, eyewitness testimony is obviously a very powerful form of evidence. And this is especially true in the United States criminal legal system. Um, I think this is a, a really nice quote um, from uh, Justice William Brennan in a dissent, uh, 1981 dissent. And he says, all the evidence points rather strikingly to the conclusion that there is almost nothing more convincing than a live human being who takes the stand points a finger at the defendant and says, that's the one. But eyewitness misidentification is the greatest contributing factor to wrongful convictions proven by DNA testing, playing a role in more than 70% of the 350 convictions overturned through DNA testing nationwide. And as I'm sure you are all aware, that number is massively artificially small because um, Many you know, cases of wrongful convictions involving eyewitness misidentification don't have DNA testing or don't have enough DNA left at the crime scene or don't have DNA testing that is suitable for testing and so on. So um, that number is incredibly small uh, relative to the number of wrongful convictions where eyewitness misidentification plays a role that is that is you know, kind of um, that is thought to, to, to hold. So what I wanna to do today is offer a close examination of the tension between the enormous epistemic weight that eyewitness testimony is afforded in the US criminal legal system and the fact that there are important questions about its reliability as a source of evidence. I'm gonna look at lineups and interrogations and I'm gonna be looking at them for a very specific reason. And that's because they are both processes um, whereby um, I, I, testimony can be extracted from eyewitnesses through practices that are manipulative, deceptive, or coercive. I'm then going to show that when testimony that is extracted in one of the one or more of these ways is given to given an unwarranted excess of credibility, the eyewitness in question is the victim of what I call agential testimonial injustice. And this is a concept that I develop, at, like I said, throughout um, the book that I'm currently writing. And I'm going to conclude that since much of the testimony of eyewitnesses is both extracted and given this excess of credibility, there is a fairly widespread form of epistemic injustice being inflicted upon testifiers in the United States criminal legal system. And so this is going to call for reforms along both dimensions. Lineups and interrogations should go through a witness's agency rather than around it. And the weight of the resulting testimony should be viewed within the broader context of its significant fallibility. So there are many factors that contribute to eyewitness misidentification, but I want to focus on those that relate to interpersonal aspects of the process by which eyewitnesses make the identification or offer the identifying testimony. And the two interpersonal processes that tend to play this role most often are lineups and interrogations. <clears throat> So in standard lineups, the lineup administrator knows who the suspect is and is so is able to provide cues to the eyewitnesses that steer the selection towards the suspect, either intentionally or unintentionally. So for instance, if a witness chooses, you know, who the administrator perceives to be the wrong suspect, they might say, are you sure? Do you want to take another look? And so on. In both live and photo lineups, non-suspect fillers often don't match the description provided by the eyewitness, which can cause the suspect to stand out to, wit to a witness. In fact, empirical evidence shows, um, your psychological studies, that having non-suspect fillers who don't match the description dramatically increases the likelihood of um, a misidentification. And without instructions from the lineup administrator, eyewitnesses often assume that the perpetrator of the crime in question is in the lineup, which can lead to the selection of a person despite doubts. And so to avoid these kinds of problems, it's recommended that lineup administrators not know which person is or which photo depicts the suspect, and that the eyewitness is informed of this so that there are no subtle cues um, being you know, um, conveyed to the witness. A lineup should also consist of at least six members, five of whom are fillers unknown to the eyewitness and who match the eyewitness's description. The suspect's position in the lineup should be determined randomly, and the eyewitness should be advised that the perpetrator may or may not be among the members. 
And people or photos should be presented one at a time with a decision made before presenting the next. And eyewitnesses should not be allowed to go over the sequence or to have people or photos placed next to one another. And this um, sequential um, way of doing lineups or photo arrays um, has been shown again through psychological studies to dramatically increase reliability because when people are shown um, of an array of people, they often reason to, pro like they often go through a process of elimination. Well, that one doesn't look like the person and that one doesn't look like the person and they reason to the person who most resembles um, who they thought, you know, was at the scene. And sequential um, lineups avoid this problem because the witness is asked to make a decision um, immediately after seeing each person or each photo. And an assessment of witness confidence should be taken at the time of the identification and before feedback from police or others. And this is because there's a lot of evidence showing that the closer witnesses get to trial, um, the higher their confidence level goes um, in their identification. So they might start off at a lineup saying, I think that's the person. And by the time they're on the stand at trial, they'll say, like, I'm certain that is the person I saw. <clears throat> Now, with respect to interrogations, um, the read technique is the um, most common interrogation technique used in North America, and um, it is used on both suspects and on witnesses. And the read technique involves two different kinds of tactics. Maximization is a hard sell approach that involves the interrogator trying to scare or intimidate the witness, offering false claims about the evidence, exaggerating the seriousness of not cooperating, and so on. While minimization is a soft sell approach in which the interrogator tries to lull the witness into a false sense of security by offering sympathy, tolerance, face-saving excuses, and even moral justification. So to just look at a concrete case, um, Troy Anthony Davis, um, the, the case of Troy Anthony Davis. So Officer Mark McPhail was working as a security guard at a Burger King in Savannah, Georgia, when he was shot and killed in a nearby parking lot as he intervened to defend a homeless man who was being assaulted, um, whose name was Larry King. Davis was found guilty uh, in 1991 of multiple counts. Um, and despite this, there was no physical evidence linking him to the crimes, and his convictions were based solely on the testimony of eyewitnesses. Well, I, and additionally, and not just eyewitnesses, there were also witnesses, but it was all witness testimony. He was sentenced to death on August 30th, 1991, and he was executed on September 21st, 2011, despite, you know, kind of a massive public outcry that there was um, very, very good evidence that he was, in fact, innocent. So there were 10 eyewitnesses and two informants who testified against him at trial. And in subsequent affidavits, an astonishing nine of the 12 witnesses revealed that their testimony was false or inaccurate. In fact, in an amicus brief, the Georgia Innocence Project identified three major problems with the trial that sent him to death row all of which focused on the witness testimony. But the two that are most relevant for our purposes are that eyewitness testimony was influenced by suggestive photo arrays and statements and testimony from eyewitnesses were the result of suggestive and coercive interrogation techniques that were design designed to incriminate Troy Davis. So for instance, Dorothy Farrell was one of the 10 eyewitnesses in, in the case and she witnessed the scene immediately after the shooting. In a post-trial affidavit, she revealed that a detective came to her house after the shooting. He showed her one photo of Troy Davis and reported to her that other witnesses had identified Troy Davis as being the shooter. Farrell was also pregnant. She was on parole. She was threatened with arrest by police and reported that she was, quote, scared that if I didn't cooperate with the detectives, then he might find a way to have me locked up again. I had four children at that time and I was taking care of them myself. I couldn't go back to jail. Larry Young is the homeless man who was beaten by the same person who had killed Officer McPhail, and he suffered a severe head wound and blood clot from the attack. After being handcuffed and locked in a police car for an hour, the detectives interrogated him at the police station for an additional three hours, withholding medical attention while he repeatedly denied being able to identify the assailant. In a post-trial affidavit, Young said, quote, the cops made it clear that we weren't leaving until I told them what they wanted to hear, leading him to confirm the version of events presented by the police in which he remembered Troy Davis beating him that evening. Quote, they suggested answers and I would give them what they wanted. So um, 
what I want to show is that um, these lineup procedures and interrogation te techniques involve it to varying degrees and in various dimensions, manipulation, deception, and coercion. Um, so Farrell, let's just, and I'm, I'm going to say a little bit more about what man manipulation, deception, and coercion are, but just at an intuitive level, Farrell was shown a single photo of just Davis rather than a lineup of six members, which is what, what's recommended. She was given an overt cue to pick him out when the officer told her that other witnesses had identified him as being the shooter. And in this way, the process seems to be manipulative insofar as the showing of the photo and the accompanying comment are intended to bring about a desired result, the identification of Dar Davis as the shooter, while bypassing Farrell's rational capacities. There also seems to be coercion and deception involved. The interrogations of both Farrell and Young used maximization techniques. For instance, Farrell was threatened with arrest. In this case, either the officers lied to her, knowing that there were insufficient grounds for actually arresting her, or they in fact planned to arrest her if she failed to give them the identification they wanted. In the latter case, the threat of jail along with the loss of her children functioned coercively. And in the former, it functioned both coercively and deceptively. And the same is true of Young, where the denial of medical attention and the implication that it would be withheld until he told the interrogators what they wanted to hear functioned coercively in the extraction of his identification. I want to mention this case, too, because I think that it also provides um, some powerful um, a powerful lens through which we can look at lineups. So in 1996, a woman who was attacked by a man with a screwdriver in St. Louis described the attacker as a clean-shaven African-American man who was wearing a baseball cap and had a gap between his teeth. About a week later, a detective arrested Antonio Beaver because he thought Beaver resembled the composite sketch. When he was placed in a physical lineup with three other men, only Beaver and one other man were wearing baseball caps, and Beaver was the only one who had a gap in his teeth. The victim identified Beaver, he was convicted in 1997, and he was sentenced to 18 years in prison until DNA evidence exonerated him in 2007. I'm going to skip this just in the interest of time. So what all three processes have in common is that the epistemic agency of the eyewitness is bypassed, exploited, or subverted in the extraction of the testimony in question. So this is the thesis. I'm going to go on to defend it. Um, I just wanted to kind of get some intuitive um, thoughts, you know, kind of on the table um, at the start. So epistemic agency is commonly understood as being grounded in a subject's responsiveness to reasons or evidence. So my epistemic agency is exercised with respect to testimony when that testimony is being responsive to reasons or evidence. So if I report to you something on the basis of reasons or evidence. So like when Dorothy Farrell was first responding to the interrogator on the basis of her memory, did she actually see the person at the scene of the crime? Did she get a good enough look? What did he look like? How tall was he? These would all be ways in which her testimony is being responsive to evidence or reasons. In the interpersonal case, where the testimony of one person is brought about by another, rational persuasion is a paradigmatic example of obtaining testimony while going through someone's agency, epistemic agency. Epistemic agency is typically understood in terms of a subject's beliefs being responsive to reasons, but we can certainly extend this notion to the offering of testimony being responsive to reasons. So for instance, um, if you are trying to convince me about the safety of the COVID-19 vaccine, um, you might elicit from me testimony that is responsive to reasons if you present all of the evidence on behalf of its safety. In contrast, testimony is extracted when it has been obtained through an interpersonal interaction that bypasses, exploits, or subverts a speaker's epistemic agency. And manipulation, deception, and coercion are the three central ways in which these sorts of interpersonal processes can extract testimony from a speaker. Now, at a high level of generality, there are two ways to influence a person's decision making. You can change the, per the, the person's options available, or you can, that's, you can, you know, that's called changing their decision space. Or you can change how the person understands those options, the internal decision making process. And rational persuasion can operate at either place. But what is key is that the persuader appeals to the person's capacity for rational deliberation and choice. In contrast, 
Manipulation bypasses or circumvents epistemic agency. And in this sense, it can be best understood as a rational influence. Now, some people, some authors understand manipulation as necessarily being covert. So Susser, Rosler, and Nissenbaum identify, you know, understand manipulation as hidden influence, the covert subversion of another person's decision-making power. Manipulation, they say, is subtle and sneaking. And what is distinctive about it is that it undermines our sense of authorship over our decisions. Other people say very similar things. Robert Gooden, for instance, says one person manipulates another when he deceptively influences him, causing the other to act contrary to his putative will. But I think that the covert or hidden nature of manipulation how it might not be as clear as these authors suggest. I mean, imagine, for instance, that right before, um, you know, juries are about, you know, jurors are about to deliberate, um, the prosecution is like very like overt about the fact that they're going to show extremely graphic photos of a crime scene um, precisely to bring about a particular emotional reaction. We might think of that appealing to people's emotional responses to, for instance, the graphic photo of a murdered child um, is to be manipulative, even if it's out in the open. Um, there are other ways we can imagine this as well. I mean, um, one of my favorite examples, um, being the parent of, of teenagers, is, um, I mean, imagine, for instance, that um, my daughter asks me to pick her up from a friend's later this evening, and I tell her I have a prior engagement. Uh, on her way out the door, she turns, looks at me and smiles and leaves her winter coat on the chair, knowing full well that because it's winter outside, I'm not going to let her walk home from her friend's house and I'm going to prioritize picking her up. We might think that that's like overtly manipulative behavior. She knows full well, in fact, she looks back at me and smiles. She knows full well that by virtue of leaving her winter coat, um, at home um, that I will, um, given my you know, sense of duty as a mother, prioritize her well-being um, over my prior commitment. Um, so I don't think myself, I don't, I don't myself think that manipulation needs to be covert in the way that many authors think that it has to be. Uh, given this for our purposes today, I think we can understand manipulation as intentional, a rational influence. So it's the circumvention of another person's rational decision-making power for the manipulator's desired end, even if it is um, overt or out in the open. Deception, um, usually a very classic way of engaging in deception is to deceive. And to deceive is roughly to aim to bring about a false belief in another person. So if I lie, um, I'm engaging in deception because I'm aiming to bring about a false belief in you. And while the category of deception subsumes deceiving, it's a broader category, including, for instance, concealing information. To conceal information is to do things to hide information from someone or to prevent them from discovering it. Often concealing information constitutes deception or attempted deception. So a concealing information, I think, can be understood widely so that it subsumes, among other phenomena, concealing evidence, which is particularly important um, when we're looking at, for instance, a cr the criminal legal system. So manipulation and deception can target both ways of influencing a speaker's decision-making, the decision space, and the internal decision-making process. Stores, for instance, can, man can manipulate the options available to you by having only sugary drinks available at checkout lines, or they can manipulate the way in which you understand these options by having only sugary drinks be eye level. You can be deceived by being told that your only options are to purchase the deluxe internet package or not at all. Or you might be deceived with respect to how you see your options by being shown the incredible internet speed using a server that's not actually the companies in question. Coercion in contrast is said to be different from both of these because it is said to target the decision space or the, the available options. So for instance, um, coercion is understood you know, one way to understand it is to offer irresistible incentives or coercing someone might mean eliminating all of the acceptable alternatives. In this way, coercion is said to depend on the rationality of the person being coerced. Remember that manipulation was understood as being a rational influence, but coercion is said to depend on the rationality of the person being coerced. Christian Coons and Michael Weber, for instance, say the instruments of coercion, threats, incarceration, other penalties, are attempts to alter the context of choice, 
making it rational for you to comply. In this way, the coercer typically treats the coerced as rational. In fact, coercion depends on the targets being rational. So while coercion robs someone of choice, it doesn't affect that person's ability to engage in rational decision making. So I think that we can see that there are several features of standard lineups that can be manipulative. The number of fillers, their similarity to the suspect, the ordering of the people, the cues provided by administrators. In all of these cases, lineup administrators can steer witnesses toward the identification of a particular person, not by appealing to rational persuasion. For instance, which would be, you know, if they were appealing to rational persuasion, they would say, so are you sure, does that person seem as tall as the person as you remember at the scene of the crime? Did that person have glasses on, short hair or long hair? But as we can see in a lot of the cases, that's not what's happening. They're circumventing their epistemic agency by giving subtle cues or by you know, manipulating the fillers and having them not look like the, you know, kind of like the, the one person that they want to be identified and so on. Lineups can also involve deception. It can involve deception regarding previously existing evidence. For instance, an administrator falsely reporting that other witnesses identified a, sus a suspect. Deception regarding the lineup process, for instance, an administrator deliberately concealing the information that the suspect may not be in the lineup. Deception regarding the consequences of not making an identification, for instance, the eyewitness is lied to about the repercussions of not choosing a suspect, such as the possibility of facing arrest. And lineups can involve coercion. When all of the acceptable alternatives have been eliminated, such as not choosing a suspect at all, not choosing a particular suspect and so on. And the eyewitness is left with only the option of identifying the person the administrator wants to be chosen. The identification is coerced. Now, Max interrogation techniques can also involve these. Um, I'm gonna skip the Allison one because I didn't go over that. Um, but in general, intimidation, offering false claims about the evidence, exaggerating the seriousness of not cooperating. All of these are manipulative and deceptive. The interrogator is steering the witness to a desired end, which is testimony with a particular content through causing false beliefs. And scaring witnesses through threats of arrest, imprisonment, loss of children, and so on are coercive because our eyewitnesses are left with no acceptable option but testifying. Now, when an eyewitness is manipulated into choosing a person in a lineup through the inclusion of dissimilar fillers, she's being irrationally influenced to conform to the administrator's aims. In other words, the administrator is not going through the eyewitness's rational faculties, but around them. And in this way, her capacity for being responsive to reasons and evidence is bypassed. When an eyewitness is deceived into identifying a suspect, perhaps through the presentation of false evidence that others have already pointed the finger at this person, her epistemic agency is being exploited. In particular, fabricating evidence that interrogators know will be compelling to a rational agent is exploiting or weaponizing the eyewitness's epistemic agency for the desired end of obtaining incriminating testimony. And coercion undermines epistemic agency by shifting the nature of the question and the relevant considerations from the theoretical to the strictly practical. For instance, the eyewitness is no longer asked to consider whether she remembers seeing the suspect with the gun, but whether she values her freedom and her children more than giving the interrogators what they want. This isn't to go through agency, around it, or even to exploit it. It's to subvert it. It is to say, at this moment, evidence and reasons about the original question are no longer on the table, and now you are simply a practical agent trying to keep your head above water. By bringing to bear swamping considerations that in many respects change the topic through the changing of options, epistemic agency is overthrown. Now, the extraction of testimony in these sorts of ways constitutes an epistemic wrong perpetrated against the testifier. And I, I, I have work um, showing this in cases of false confessions. <clears throat> And I think it's really vivid in false confessions. But surprisingly, there has been far, far less work um, on the, the wrong of the extraction done to the eyewitnesses, because most of the attention is played to the wrongful conviction of the suspect or defendant who has been wrongly identified. 
And of course, there are no words to capture the, you know, kind of the, the, the you know, pernicious injustice done to the person who is wrongly convicted by being wrongfully identified, you know, through these kinds of tactics. Um, but what I want to draw attention to are also like the ways in which the eyewitnesses have been wronged. Um, and not only in like, obviously the guilt that, they, that many of them feel for having sent someone to prison or even, to, you know, to have played a role in their execution, but um, also in their, you know, kind of their sense of, of, of dignity and kind of personhood um, in the way that they are treated when their testimony is being extracted. So obtaining testimony through manipulative and deceptive practices is to treat testifiers as epistemic tools to be influenced by and molded to the aims of others. And extracting testimony via coercive methods is to weaponize the testifier's own epistemic agency against her for the desired end of the interrogator. When reasons and evidence are ineffective or inconvenient, the extractor turns to trickery, lies, and brute force. But I now want to turn to, I think, an interestingly different way in which eyewitness identifications are, I guess, like broadly mistreated, resulting in a wrong um, perpetrated against the eyewitness. And that's the excess of credibility that it is afforded. So eyewitness testimony, once extracted, is often given a massively unwarranted excess of credibility in the criminal legal system. Otherwise put, eyewitness testimony is frequently regarded as far more honest and reliable than it ought to be. So one way to see this is that convictions are often secured entirely or largely on the basis of eyewitness testimony, despite the fact that such evidence can be easily manipulatable and highly unreliable. So there's no published research, for instance, showing that interview techniques involving maximization and minimization facilitate accurate and complete memories from eyewitnesses. There's just none. Lineups and interrogation techniques can be used to manipulate, deceive, and coerce witnesses into offering false testimony, as we've seen, and as there, I mean, these are just the tip of the iceberg. There is case after case after case we could be discussing today. Research also shows that attitudes and beliefs are susceptible to influence and change through persuasion, especially when the source is regarded as high in credibility, which many interrogators and administrators are. And eyewitness identifications themselves are often dangerously unreliable, evidenced by the fact that they are the leading cause of false um, wrongful convictions in the United States. There's also cross-race bias, <clears throat> which involves individuals having um, <clears throat> less difficulty identifying and remembering faces of their own race than those of a different, less familiar race. So while eyewitness identifications are often unreliable, cross-racial identifications, which involve an eyewitness of one race identifying a criminal suspect of another race, are particularly untrustworthy. 42% of wrongful convictions involving eyewitness misidentification also involved cross-racial misidentification. And cross-racial misidentifications are especially unreliable when a white eyewitness identifies a black, a black suspect. More precisely, a Black innocent suspect has a 56% greater chance of being misidentified by a white eyewitness than by a Black eyewitness. As Duff McGee writes, eyewitness testimony may be the least reliable and yet the most compelling. Now, when a witness provides re testimony that identifies a suspect as the perpetrator of a crime, it is often massively privileged over a later recantation, even when the original identification is the sole or primary evidence on behalf of guilt and the recantation is supported by corroborating evidence. Now, legal scholars have noted the credibility deficit that's attached to recanting testimony, pointing to a general judicial skepticism that has become so universal that it appears to have given rise to an inference that recantation evidence is not trustworthy and should be treated as such, absent the movement's ability to persuade otherwise. This is often supported by what this, this um, opinion in People uh, versus Shilatano. <clears throat> This is a quote. Um, uh, so um, th here's the quote. There is no form of proof so unreliable as recanting testimony. In the popular mind, it is often regarded as of great importance. Those experienced in the administration of the criminal law know well its untrustworthy character. But what hasn't been fully appreciated is the flip side of this. So, you know, it has been recognized in the legal literature that there is this just deficit 
um, this just kind of judicial skepticism that we see with recantations. But what people don't recognize is the flip side of that, and that's the massive excess of credibility that's given to the original eyewitness testimony. Most of the considerations on behalf of discounting recantations cut both ways and provide no reason for a general preference for the original testimony of eyewitnesses. For instance, recantations are thought to reveal the untrustworthiness of the witness. Fears are expressed that the witness has recanted under duress or because of coercion. Close relationships between defendants and witnesses are cited as reason for skepticism. And worries are expressed about the court being manipulated. But each of these could be equally invoked to call into question the reliability of the eyewitness identification in the first place. To the extent that these considerations raise concerns about reliability, identifications and recantations should be in the same exact epistemic vote. But courts systematically treat them not only differently, but radically so. In fact, identifications are preferred even when the original testimony is offered by vulnerable witnesses prone to fear or intimidation and their later adult selves recant with very plausible explanations for why they were dishonest in the first place. In a very well-known case, Kathleen Crowell Webb at the age of 16 accused Gary Dotson of abducting and raping her. Eight years later, while she was married and riddled with guilt, she recanted her testimony, admitting that she fabricated the accusation out of fear of a possible pregnancy from a consensual relationship at that time. Despite her maturation and the very plausible explanation of the unreliability of her original testimony, the judge found that Webb's trial testimony was more credible than her recantation at a hearing that Dotson requested. Eventually, however, in 1989, he became the first person, Dotson, in the United States to be exonerated on the basis of DNA evidence. Credibility, another way we can see a, the massive excess of credibility that is given to re, um, to eyewitness identifications is that they're resistant to counter evidence. Again, um, let's look at what the judge said in Shilatano, bearing in mind that the witnesses to crimes, this is a quote, are often of a low and degraded character and that <clears throat> after they have given their testimony, they are sometimes influenced by bribery and other improper considerations. It is evident that the establishment of a rule which left the power to grant a new trial to a defendant to depend upon recantation by such witnesses would be subversive to the proper of the proper administration of justice. So we here see here just a straightforward bias, right, against people who, um, who are witnesses, um, saying that they're a, of a low and degraded character. And that are the, those are the grounds for privileging the original identification and rejecting the, the, the recantation. Obviously, I think you can see that that makes absolutely no epistemic sense and is grounded in nothing more than a bias. So we see that eyewitness testimony is weighed too heavily. It distorts other evidence such as recantations, which are just seen as you know, kind of evidence of unreliability. And it's resistant to counter evidence. Think about the case of um, Troy Davis, where, um, <clears throat> you know, nine of the witnesses recanted and said that they had been coerced into testifying. Um, nevertheless, the st you know, state went through with executed him. So again, way too heavily, um, we saw that, you know, the testimony not only secures convic convictions, but also executions. Given how fallible and manipulatable eyewitnesses are, this is just far too much weight. It distorts other evidence, such as recantations, and it's resistant to counter evidence, as we you know, saw in the Davis case. So I now want to identify what I call agential testimonial injustice. A speaker is the victim of what I call agential testimonial injustice when these two things happen to them. When they have testimony that is extracted in a way that bypasses, exploits, or subverts their epistemic agency, and then that testimony is given an unwarranted access of credibility. So the second kind of wrong, I already mentioned the first kind of wrong of agential testimonial injustice is in the extraction. But the second kind results from that excess of credibility. And here one is epistemically wronged by virtue of being regarded as a testifier or a giver of knowledge only when one's testimony is extracted and is thus the product of a process that subverts one's epistemic agency. I think there's an instructive parallel here. In ancient Athens, enslaved persons testified in judicial proceedings only under torture. So they were regarded as credible only when their testimony was extracted through interrogation techniques that undermined their epistemic agency. And I think that, you know, kind of shockingly, we see something very similar here. 
We see that repeatedly, systematically, over and over again at every stage of the criminal legal process. This is what I'm showing in my book. We see that the system treats people, suspects, victims, witnesses across the board as knowers or as you know, kind of worthy of being believed only when they are, their epistemic agency is bypassed, weaponized, or subverted. <clears throat> now, there's a very well-known notion of testimonial injustice operative in the literature um, that's due um, in large part to the work of Miranda Fricker, where she argues that testimonial injustice involves a speaker suffering a credibility deficit that's owed to a prejudice that targets her social identity. And when this pre prejudice tracks the su subject through different dimensions of social activity, it is systematic. And the type that tracks people in this way is related to social identity, such as racial and gender identity. And when someone is the victim of testimonial injustice this way, Miranda Fricker argues that they are wronged in their capacity as a knower. But she's very, very clear that only credibility deficits can lead to testimonial injustice. And she grounds this in the rejection of a distributive model of credibility, which I'm not going to go into in the interest of time. But what I, what I want to point out here at the end of this talk is that what we see by paying close attention to the way that we treat people in the criminal legal system, there is an entirely different notion of testimonial justice that is fundamentally grounded in speakers receiving an excess of credibility. Agential testimonial injustice shares not a single feature with the standard conception, but it's testimonial injustice nonetheless. So lineups and interrogations often extract testimony from eyewitnesses through practices that are manipulative, deceptive, or coercive. When such extracted testimony is given an unwarranted excess of credibility, the eyewitnesses in question are the victims of what I call a gentle testimonial injustice. Testifiers who suffer from this are wronged in two ways, both in having their epistemic agency bypassed, exploited, or subverted in the obtaining of their testimony, and in then being regarded as truthful only when they are not properly exercising their epistemic agency. Since much of the testimony of eyewitnesses in, in criminal cases in the United States is both extracted and given an excess of credibility, agential testimonial injustice is fairly widespread within the criminal legal system. Otherwise put, courts are systematically privileging forms of testimonial evidence that are derived from the state straightforward application of state power. This calls for significant reforms along both dimensions. Lineups and interrogations should go through the epistemic agency of eyewitnesses rather than around them. And the resulting testimony should be viewed as a highly fallible source of evidence that needs to be substantially corroborated. Such reforms have the result of not only treating witnesses as rational agents deserving of epistemic respect, but also of reducing the number of life-shattering wrongful convictions based on false eyewitness testimony. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer. You packed a, a huge amount in there. That was um, excellent, very, very clear. Um, I do have a few questions myself to start with, but I also want to see, do we have questions in the room or comments in the room? We do have a few. Uh, excellent. And Robin, do we have some online as well? In the chat, we've got a few. Okay, we'll start in the room then, and I'll save my questions. Uh, we'll go left to right. So if you had your hand up, give me a wave. Hello. Thank you for your talk. That was really interesting. Um, I was wondering, I guess this is a practical question rather than a philosophical one, but what what the reason is for this situation? It strikes me that the justice system is basically prioritizing a practical outcome or a conviction above the truth. Like they don't care about the truth because they want to secure a conviction, like purely from watching crime dramas, you know, you always sense that the police are under so much pressure to get a conviction. So that might be the reason for all of this coercion and um, undermining people's epistemic agency. I was just curious if that was something you'd looked at. Yeah, so, <clears throat> I mean, I've given a lot of talks on, on this, these issues over the years. And in the United States, um, I think there's like a lot of um, there's there really is just um, like deep suspicion and skepticism of you know police and prosecutors and you know people who are um, you know, incarcerating people in this country. 
But I, I myself, when I get the comment, you know, the question, and not, I'm not suggesting you're saying this, but I oftentimes get the get a question, you know, that, that really suggests that um, all of the people who are involved in the incarceration of the over 2 million people in this country um, really just have no regard at all for the truth. And I don't think that that's true. I mean, I, I mean, many of these people who are policing and the prosecutors work in a community where, let's say, a violent crime occurred. They have family members, they have friends, they care about their communities. Um, and I don't think that it is even psychologically plausible to believe that they don't care at all about whether they get the wrong, the you know, the, the right person or the wrong person. Um, you know, um, incarcerated for, for, let's say, like I said, a very violent crime. <clears throat> I think there's a lot of, of, of factors at work here. So some is that people have been led to believe um, that these tactics and processes work. They have been told this by experts. The read technique, um, you know, they're, they're when, I mean, if you just go to their website and look, they like literally like promise to dramatically increase reliability at like deception detection. Empirical evidence shows that this is just wrong, right? Experts are like, um, the average person is no better than chance at detecting deception. And experts who go through this training um, are not much better than the ordinary person. So I think that there are a lot of false beliefs about our reliability um, in these processes. Um, I think that being in a community where you're being trained in a particular way, I mean, I was at a conference a couple of years ago on false confessions and it had, you know, judges and prosecutors and defense attorneys. And, you know, I think I was the only philosopher there. And um, one of the people who was there um, did, does a lot of the training across the country in the United States for police officers with interrogation. And he got up because there were social scientists talking about how, how you know, unreliable these techniques are, and, you know, lots and lots of, of academics and people talking about this. And he got up and he said, we got very good at getting confessions. Unfortunately, we didn't realize that we didn't get very good at getting true confessions. And I think that there was just this deep belief before all of the social science scientists told us otherwise, that no one would falsely confess to something that they didn't do. I mean, there are cases for, after case of people confessing to killing their parents, their sibling, and uh, that they didn't do. And I just think that that sort of defied logic, like nobody thought that people would do this. So... I think there's just been this long-standing belief in the criminal legal system that these techniques work, that no one is going to come in and say something that is going to put them at risk. Why we think that these same techniques should be used for witnesses, I don't know. But there's a long-standing belief that these sorts of um, tactics work. Um, and so I do believe that that's at least partly what's, what's, what's going on here. Thank you. We have another question in the room. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I was thinking that um, now we have more and more video evidence of the crimes. And yet again, we keep seeing the same kind of injustice being served as well, even when you have video evidence. So is there a way of like using these video evidence to compare with the witnesses and see um, um, a way of like separating what's a systemic problem of this over condemnation of like people, for example, and what's really a problem of the the um, quality of the memory of people or these methods of identification. When you say video, do you mean of actual crimes occurring? Uh, yes, yes. So, so like. We have videos of people like, for example, doing all kinds of things. And even though there is video, people interpret the video in a way that is unjust. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, I definitely think that, um, you know, video evidence is, is you know, when available. And, and it is available still in a very small percentage of, of crimes, just, you know, kind of percentage wise. Um, so, I mean, certainly that will 
complicate things. Um, I mean, in the United States, I mean, so many um, body cam videos have just fundamentally changed the way that I think the public looks at policing. I mean, so many of these cases where police officers are being prosecuted would not have occurred without body cam. I mean, just this wouldn't have. So um, that is, I mean, there definitely, you know, it is a significant impact that we see from videos. Um, but I also think that, um, you know, as you mentioned, videos can be subject to interpretation and can be subject to manipulation as well, just in terms of the way that um, the story is told. Um, and of course, oftentimes, even when there is video, you see like a snippet and there's a before and an after. And the before and the after can also be massively subject to a lot of the concerns that I discussed in my talk. Um, so I think that video evidence, you know, certainly plays an interesting role in these conversations. But I think that even when they're present, um, there still are a lot of these kinds of concerns um, surrounding oftentimes what is oftentimes just a snippet. Thank you. We'll take uh, one more in the room, then we'll go to a few online. Yeah, I have a similar question, actually. Um, thinking about DNA evidence, you pointed out at the beginning that um, there are many cases in which there is insufficient DNA evidence, but the quality of and access to DNA evidence might surely is increasing now as um, it becomes more sophisticated. And I would have thought that creates the opportunity for the emphasis which is placed on eyewitness evidence to be reduced and greater emphasis to be placed, placed on DNA evidence when it is available. And I'm wondering if that is happening or whether there is a resistance to that shift, de-emphasizing eyewitness adding to the emphasis of DNA evidence, and if there is resistance, why that's the case? <clears throat> yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. So, um, so there's, there's several things to say. So, um, so first of all, um, there are still a huge number. I mean, it's a significant percentage of cases um, where there are convictions on the basis of just purely eyewitness identification, where there's just no relevant DNA. So, um, I mean, one of the things that you see a lot of people advocating who work in these areas is for alternative um, legal paths to overturn wrongful convictions. In the United States, we have been so focused on DNA exonerations, um, but there has been a lot of talk about finding legal pathways I mean, like, look, I mean, if you are convicted, wrongfully convicted based on, on eyewitness identification and you see the judicial attitude towards recantations, I mean, how, what is your path forward for, for, for coming home, right? For like kind of getting your life back if you're wrongfully convicted and there's no DNA evidence. Um, and so there has been a lot of talk about like not, de not depending so heavily on DNA because there have to be, I mean, there's tons of wrongful convictions that have no relevant DNA. But um, even when there is DNA available, I mean, some of the most egregious cases I know of um, involve false confessions where someone falsely confessed, then there was DNA evidence that showed them to, uh, showed that, that, like, that, for instance, if there was like a rape involved, that the semen at the scene of the crime was not theirs. You wouldn't believe the lengths that prosecutors have gone to in the United States. And I don't know if you see something similar in the UK, but the lengths that they go to, to, to not ever admit that they, that they you know, convicted the wrong person. So there is a term in the literature called the unindicted co-ejaculator. And the reason that there is this term is because it is so widely used by prosecutors. So there's a very famous case in Illinois. So many of the awful cases come from like this, my home state where um, this man was convicted three separate jury trials. He was found guilty of raping and murdering this 11 year old child. He's home now, he's free. He actually owns a barber shop in Chicago, but three separate jury trials, he was found guilty even after DNA showed that the semen that was found inside, inside the 11 year old was not his. What the prosecutors argued and got the jury to convict on this basis was that the 11 year old must have had prior sex with some unknown male and that then Juan Rivera came, raped her, failed to ejaculate and killed her. 
this is, this is an outrageous theory. I mean, she was 11. There was z- absolutely zero evidence that she was sexually active. So I, I mentioned this because you might think that DNA evidence is like, well, when there's DNA, then we just, you know, all of these problems go away. And this is what the part of my talk when I talked about how eyewitness identifications, confessions, a lot of the things I look at are resistant to counter evidence. It's because even when you have something that you think is like the gold standard, like DNA, even then you, you see that convictions aren't overturned. And again, I don't know how much this carries over to the UK, but you see this over and over in the United States. There was a, a famous case I think I was reading about in Private Eye uh, magazine last week of someone who was convicted of biting a police officer with someone else's teeth. So I, th- I think it, it does carry over. I'm not sure our police officers are all that different in general. I hate to generalize about it. Um, we do have more questions in the room, but I'd love to uh, include a few people online. Could we go to Amina? I hope I'm pronouncing your name. Yeah, Amina. it's Amina Memon. Hi. Um, I've been doing eyewitness research for 30 odd years now. Just pure coincidence, I've just joined this group. So it's great to hear your talk. Thank you so much for that. I agreed with most of what you say. Um, in terms of the UK miscarriages of justice, we've had them um, starting with the 70s. Um, people in the audience will be familiar with the Guildford Four and the Birmingham Six which resulted in the Royal Commission of Criminal Justice changing the law. So we now have videotaped a suspect interrogations. We have a more of an investigative approach to interviews. But that's not to say we don't have miscarriages of justice. And I totally agree with you. And the problem with DNA evidence is, yes, it's there. But if you have a hypothesis and you're out to test your hypothesis that the person you've got is the guilty person, you're going to view all the other evidence, the eyewitness evidence and the confession evidence through that lens. Um, uh, One of the things I wanted to check with you was, um, whether I uh, heard you correctly, was you said um, coercion doesn't impede rational decision making. Is that correct? So the standard view of coercion is that it depends on you being rational. So you've got to, so if I say, you know, gun to your head, wallet or your life, I that is only successful to the extent that you recognize that your life is way more valuable than your wallet. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the sense in which people often kind of characterize coercion as being unlike deception and, and manipulation in really needing the person being coerced to be rational, to recognize. Yeah. And the reason I comment on that, because one of the What we have had in the UK, and and we were discussing, I was chairing an earlier talk um, by Professor Gisley Good-Johnson, you've probably heard of him, he's done a lot of the work around vulnerability and suggestibility, and the problem with individuals who have low IQ or other neurodiversities is those individuals enter into an interview thinking, even if they confess, they can still go home at the end of the day, or that if they say something, it can be retracted, um, and, and it's okay, or that the DNA or evidence will, will clear them eventually. And so in that case, you've got vulnerable individuals. And this is where the UK has made great progress in providing support. Again, the policies there, whether it converts to practice, we don't know. And I think you have the same problem in the US. But, you know, this has been a major issue in that a, a substantial proportion of the population that fall prey to the kinds of areas you've talked about are individuals who are vulnerable um, and and are easily manipulated by, as you've you've talked about. Just one more comment about the UK when it comes to lineups, which is one of my areas, is we do have double blind lineups. So the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, the codes of practice. So police officers should not, strictly speaking, know the um the position of the person in the lineup we do video parades here so as far as i know that's mostly followed but i do occasionally get cases where i see that that's not being adhered to so but we do have and and that is in in our all our guidance 
Yeah, you guys have definitely made progress. I mean, I don't know the UK system anywhere like I know the, the US system, but I mean, only this, I'd say a few months ago, I mean, the press release was just a few months ago, Illinois announced that it will no longer allow police officers to lie to juveniles. Yeah. Illinois is the first state in the United States, just to juveniles, right? Like, yeah. like, but it's fine to tell like an 18 year old person with, you know, kind of a cognitive disability yeah. that you have his DNA, right? Yeah. I yeah. mean, you know, also there's like been a big movement to um, videotape all confessions and interviews from start to finish. You know, there's been a movement to use um, information gathering interrogation techniques rather than confrontational interrogation techniques. So I think you guys have made progress on some of these issues. Our, our criminal legal system, it's, it's just unreal. I mean, it's just incredible the things that we do to people. So I, I, it's not to say that you guys don't have your problems, but I, I do think that you are ahead of the United States on the kinds of changes that will at least reduce the number of wrongful convictions that we see. Yeah, I agree. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amina. We'll, we'll come back to the room in a second. I'll, I'll just take one more online and then we'll come to the rest of you uh, in a bit. Um, Paul, uh, Paul Fletcher, can you ask your question? Yes, just hold on. I will start the video. And don't put yourself on mute when you start the video. I know the buttons are close to each other, but uh, there we, now you can there hear you. me as well. I've got to this age and can't work an unmute button. Strange, isn't it? Um, what I wanted to ask about is the um, regarding the witness being regarded as giving like first order evidence that being turned into a credibility excess. And then the uh, interrogator will have an, an approach of credibility deficit towards the witness in some ways. And then because they are more familiar with higher order evidence techniques of looking at the evidence, they can manipulate the witness's credibility so they can bamboozle them, as Amina said, bamboozle them and coerce them. Um, to make a wrong identification. So I wondered if you had any thoughts on that and any thoughts on what used to be known as a CSI effect regarding juries at all. Um, I'm sorry, so I, just to be clear, are you saying, are, do I have any thoughts on like the act, the interrogation technique, eliciting kind yeah. of fear and responses yeah. that make them look objectively unreliable? Is that the kind of question? Yeah, when they can when they can actually get a witness and they can use their techniques on there to sway a witness towards a, a, a wrongful identification when the witness internally believes they're absolutely correct on an identification. So they, they, they're coerced into changing their belief, so to speak. Oh, oh yes, yeah. yes, yes. I actually find this more fascinating with confessions, like internalized false confessions, where um, interrogators get people to believe, like, yep, I, I, I murdered my own parents. I murdered my sister, right? I must have blacked out. There must be, I mean, you see interrogations where like kids will say, there must be a good Michael and a bad Michael. And I guess bad Michael was jealous of my sister. So I murdered her in my sleep, but don't remember it. I mean, um, yes. So, I mean, it, like I said, I'm writing a whole book on these, these issues. So I discussed that kind of phenomenon a little bit more with the confessions um, and how I think that there's a particular kind of like perniciousness to the co-opting not only of someone's testimony, but of their like belief states as well. And the encroachment on, you know, what I call their epistemic agency. So if we're in the realm of asking questions about justice, for instance, um, the co-opting of their sort of belief states, of their mental attitudes, their memories, there's something even like kind of more pernicious, sort of a, a deeper kind of targeting of their dignity as an epistemic agent. Um, to get them to not only tell you what you want to hear, but to actually believe what you want to hear. I also have a chapter in my book on extracting um, remorse, apologies, admissions of guilt at like parole hearing, at like in front of parole boards and at sentencing hearings. And I think there is also like something um, kind of pernicious about, you know, getting someone to act sorry, you know, act remorseful when they didn't do anything. Do you know what I mean? As the only condition for release 
available, right? To apologize to a victim's family when they didn't do anything, they're innocent, you know? Um, so I think there's a lot of different ways in which what I call agential testimonial injustice encroaches on people. And I think you're exactly right that like when it encroaches on your memories, your belief states, there's something particularly, um, just particularly harmful about that. Thank you, Jennifer. We've got a few more in the room. Uh, I've been promised a quick question here. Um, thank you. That, that was a fascinating lecture. And I, it's a very short question. Um, you know, early on you were talking about the questionable lineups where uh, you've got people of different heights, possibly different ethnic mixes in a lineup. Do the defense actually have access to these lineups uh, at the time or during the trial or whenever? I mean, they're legal. Please. Um, they're legally entitled to them. But I mean, of course, what is the law and what actually happens in practice is a dramatically different thing oftentimes. Moreover, there's also the relevant question about what jurors have access to and what they are told, right? I mean, this is one of the things that we saw a lot with confessions is that, like, so remember the, the case I was telling you about, about the unindicted co-ejaculator Juan Rivera? Um, you know, I, this, this, again, this is a local story. So like, you know, I, and because of my work in this area, like, I mean, I know Juan Rivera, he was represented by Northwestern attorneys and his, Holly Staker, the victim had a twin sister and they recently interviewed the twin sister and said, you know, how do you feel about this? And she said, I believe that Juan Rivera is, was the, the murderer of my sister. How could he have known those details if he didn't do it? And that's because we don't have actually a recording, right? We don't have a recording of the interrogation. Please. Don't worry, Jennifer, we take don't, a moment if you need to. <laughs> we don't have, oh, he's fine. He's, anyway, he's a border collie. So he's just like always on high alert, like thinking someone's grabbing the sheep, you know? Um, so, um, I, you know, I think that um, what, you know, what we see, I lost my train of thought because of the dog. What, what was the question again? I will, uh, go on. Yeah. Uh, basically, it was uh, how much access the defense have to right, uh, these right. questionable lineups. Yes. And what I was focusing on is that it's important that the defense has access to it, but also that it be presented during the trial and that the jurors have access to it. Because even sometimes when the defense has access to it, it's not either it's not presented or it's not admitted or it's not allowed for some reason or the prosecution makes some argument about why it shouldn't be included. And when you see this, I mean, like this, like I said, with, with confessions, you end up just getting this like coherent narrative where it looks like the suspect has access to all of these details that only the killer would know, right? Um, but in fact, if they had access to the techniques and what, what happened and how many days it took and to get this confession and so on, I think the jurors would have a very different attitude. And so being able, this is something that the United States has been highly resistant to. I'm really curious if, what about the UK, but um, expert testimony about the unreliability of eyewitness identifications, for instance, like calling social psychologists to the stand to talk about how unreliable eyewitness identifications are. The United States has been very reluctant to allow this kind of testimony at trials. It would make a huge difference to have social, you know, social scientists get on the stand and talk about how easy it is to get any one of us to confess to something we didn't do. Just, you know, deprive us of sleep for enough days, you know, and so on, you know, make some subtle promises and threats, you know, and so on, right? I just wondered on that point, um, Jennifer, you, you talked about the very high percentage that were incorrect uh, or pro proven false of eyewitness testimonies. What, do you have a sense of what proportion of cases overall involve eyewitness testimony? Like how widespread is it? And does that explain some of the reluctance to challenge its um, reliability? I mean, eyewitness identification in the United States is a like leading cause of evidence um, for, you know, I mean, the number, I'm not saying that the number of cases where that's all the evidence that is had, but eyewitness identifications play a role in a very significant percentage of convictions in the United States. I don't have the number off. The, I mean, I don't, I don't know if they're, I mean, I don't know 
the number is out there, but um, I do know that there is enough empirical evidence that it plays a, a very significant role in a, in a, in a you know. So essentially some of the, the house of cards crumb topples if you, if you take away that, that piece from a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. um, we had a question from you, Brian. Hi there, thank you very much. I, I recognize a great deal of, of that, partly because I spent some years as a full-time police psychologist helping the police force to try to do things in a better way. I'm kind of uh, appalled that John Reed still gets a mention because we are talking about classic work 50 years ago. I know. And there's been so much work done since then. I know. Um, I, I just pause here to say hi to Amina Memon, who is one of our most distinguished researchers in the UK. And it turns out that um, my wife recognizes her from a completely different channel. So sometimes this eyewitness stuff works wonders. But one of the things that I think is an interest, it, it, it might be a distinction, is that in the United States, and I think in Scotland too, up to a point, prosecutors are very closely involved with their witnesses. Um, they, they, they speak a lot to them and prepare them very well. Whereas it's been the tradition in England is that that's dangerous and that prosecutors don't talk to their witnesses. Once the witness has given a statement to the police or been interviewed on a videotaped record, then that is left until they get to court. But wow. otherwise it causes a zealous bit, a zealous sense of teamwork, which mm -hmm. is counterproductive. We, we, we can all see that. And in North Europe in Canada and, and in Israel, indeed, um, the, these, these flaws and faults have been well recognized. But what's in common with all our countries is whatever you say, and I'm not keen to get academic social psychologists on this stand, is that lawyers hate all of us because there's not an aspect of testimonial <laughs> material which isn't flawed and at fault. And they see us arguing for, for the acquittal of everyone. And I think that's unfair, but we have to put up with that. It, on the few occasions we get into the box, it's mm -hmm. very hostile. Mm -hmm. And now, whether they'll welcome a philosopher, <laughs> well, in Scotland they may do. <laughs> You'd get a better ride than I have. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, um, so, I mean, I think that you are exactly right um, about the relationship between the prosecutor and witnesses. Um, it's in the United States, it's not just that prosecutors get extremely, I mean, become friends with witnesses. It is not uncommon for them to become very, very close with the victim and the victims, I mean, the victim's family. And it just ends up becoming this, um, I mean, I remember talking to a prosecutor one time in the United States about um, why he was fighting um, the release of a very elderly incarcerated person when all of the empirical evidence shows that, um, you know, it's, there's, there's like the likelihood of this person committing a violent crime after the age of 60 is like, you know, minuscule, right? Um, so what is the reasoning here? Is it, you know, pun just purely punitive is, I mean, cause this is not public safety at this point. I mean, you can't even try to make that argument. And he said, like, I made a promise to the victim's family that he'd never see the light of day again. And I think that in the United States, that, that like, you know, kind of two different sides, two different teams is, I mean, two different sides. I mean, I'm in the courtroom a lot just because I also founded this prison education program at Northwestern. And so I'm at a lot of resentencing hearings and, you know, it literally is like, you've got your side to sit on and there's the other side, right? And it's like literally even visually, like that in many courtrooms. And I think that um, you're right that it would be a lot better off, I think, if, um, if the testimony was taken. I, I think this also contributes to a lot of the empirical evidence. I'd be curious to see in the UK though, because there's a lot of evidence that shows that as uh, witnesses get closer to trial, their confidence level increases. And I wonder how much of that is through repeated interaction with the prosecutors and how much of that is due to another, another phenomenon. Um, but at least in the United States, there is so much preparation and so much, con you know, what you should wear, whether you should shave, how you should talk, how you should look, how you should order your testimony, and so on. Thank you. Um, we've got a few more questions online. I'm going to let you come in quickly, Robin, before we go back online. 
Hi, Jennifer. That, that was great. Sorry, I'm a, you might call a, a lay general philosopher and not really an expert in, in law, but uh, I did experience the uh, cross-race bias when it uh, was shown three books of uh, faces of um, gentlemen uh, who were uh, black um, after a handbag snatch, and I had no uh, chance whatsoever of trying to identify them. Um, but coming on to a more general point, um, we're talking about you know credibility here in the broadest sense, yeah. Um, and I just wonder how broadly applicable this is. I'm thinking of flat Earth. I'm I'm thinking of um, you know broad philosophical principles here. That what's acceptable is that, for example, somebody stands up, up as a politician, and uh, they, there's that face-to-face -face credibility thing. It's, it's seen in advertising. It's seen in religion. It's seen all over the place, and it's all part of the zeitgeist that we're we tend to believe, you know, the, the face and the person that we see. So, you know, is there any way that you can see maybe in a hundred years that might change in terms of awareness? Uh, I've just had a look at your book, which seems fabulous, by the way, Epistemology of Groups, and I'm definitely going to read it. But I, I'm just wondering how general the principles that you talk about in terms of in specific terms and legal terms, how can they be possibly applied more generally in society, thank you. Yeah, so I guess I wanted to mention, first let me just say that that book, The Epistemology Groups, that's not the one that talks about this stuff. This That book is um, in like written form right now, so it'll be going to the publisher probably within the next month or so. Uh, that book is gonna be called Criminal Testimonial Injustice. Um, so like kind of broader thoughts, so I mean, I think that there are two different aspects of the phenomenon of agential testimonial injustice, both of which are worthy of, I think, all of us asking, um, not just in the context of the criminal legal system, but more broadly. So there's the extraction component of agential testimonial injustice. And I look in my book, not only at like administrators or, um, um, you know, interrogators, detectives, and so on, extracting testimony. But I look at how any time social forces can function coercively, testimony can be extracted to varying degrees. Um, now, this is a very extreme case, but for instance, I discuss cases where, um, a, you know, kind of um, abusers um, get domestic violence victims to recant their um, claims of abuse and how their threats about the kids or the house and so on function coercively. So I think that we can see manipulation, deception and coercion functioning throughout our, our lives, not just in the criminal legal system to varying degrees, whenever there is like social pressure of some kind or other to say something that doesn't really reflect our own values or our own reasons or our own autonomy or agency. Um, and I think that when we regard that testimony from someone as somehow really being their truest self, I think we should, we should be worried about that. That's one component. The other is the massive excess of credibility that we're, give, we're giving to this. And I think that that also is like a general phenomenon that we should be worried about. It's really fascinating because one chapter of my book, all I do is talk about how both in the law and in philosophy and in the social sciences, you see what I call the one directional model. And that's this belief, both normatively and descriptively, that if we're going to do someone wrong in how we treat their speech, it's always going to function in one direction, and that is as a deficit. So this is really like the heart of Miranda Fricker's book on testimonial injustice. We harm people. So there's like a ton of work in critical race theory showing that like black defendants, black victims are, you know, kind of not believed. They're regarded as liars. There's a ton of work in like kind of feminist scholarship showing how women aren't believed on the stand and how women's demeanor is, you know, kind of a strike against their credibility. And one of the things that I try to argue in one of the chapters of my book is that this, the, the situation is, is multi-directional, the way in which we harm people and their speech, right? And I talk about how it twists and it turns and it's sometimes it's completely turned on its head. So women are regarded as liars when they report, you know, kind of sexual assault in the United States criminal legal system. But if it is a white woman pointing the finger at a black man, all of a sudden she's given a massive excess of credibility. Um, a black man might be regarded as a liar in the criminal legal system, but when he confesses to a violent crime, he's massively believed. So one of the things that I point out in this chapter is that this 
deficit model, this one directional model that pervades scholarship in, you know, kind of in academia is just really misguided. We harm people in many different directions, right? And we harm people by believing them too much. And this somehow is, I think, like very paradoxical for people to think, but it's true. When you say something really awful and I believe you too much, I can harm you just by as, as much as I can by thinking that you're a liar. And so that's one of the takeaways that I think goes beyond the criminal legal system in my book is that um, this one directional deficit model is way too limiting. Unfortunately, we can hurt people in a lot of other ways. Okay. Thank you, Jennifer. We're, we're coming to the end. We do have a few questions online. Could we try to make them uh, pretty quick? Then we should be able to get through all of them. Let's go to you first, Terry. Oh, hi. Um, very good lecture. Very, uh, very, very enjoyable. Um, can I ask the question about, you mentioned um, psychologists getting involved in, in the legal process and how unwelcome that would be. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about not so much psychologists as neuroscientists, because eyewitness accounts depend upon memory. Um, and we're getting more and more evidence from neuroscience that memories are not what we think they are, but yeah. they are artificially constructed, uh, perhaps spontaneously. And that in remembering, being asked to remember a particular incident three times, right. you will construct it three times. Um, so there is an, then an, an, an ethical question which, which carries over in, into the general debate as to how reliable evidence of eyewitness accounts um, can be, um, which is very much a, a philosophical issue. Absolutely. I mean, I didn't talk about like, I mean, there's so much empirical evidence done and you're right, like not just by psychologists, but like neuroscientists and social scientists, there's a lot of really good empirical work out there. You know, there's all sorts of studies that show that um, when someone has a weapon, um, the likelihood of a, an accurate identification goes down because your attention is on the weapon. Um, you know, kind of whenever there's a stressful situation, reliable identifications go down. All of this should be taken into account, right? All of this should be relevant. When we are determining like people's fate, right? And we, I mean, in the United States, we like execute people, right? I mean, it's like on the basis of these, th this testimony. Um, it's shocking that we're not letting jurors hear just how unreliable these processes can be, even when you believe it. I mean, even when you haven't been influenced in these sorts of ways. So I'm of course, particularly interested in testimony that's extracted. So I focus on interpersonal cases like lineups and interrogations. But I think that your comment also just points to how there's a whole bunch of other non-interpersonal dimensions, just our memories, right? That should also be relevant to our assessment of the reliability of identifications. That's I think exactly right, yeah. Um, let's go to Chris next, if you can unmute. Hello. Uh, yes, I was intrigued by your statement that uh, less weight is given to recantations uh, by people because they're, for want of a better word, low lives. But surely, if they were low lives when they recanted, they also were when they gave the original testimony. So how do they rationalise that or? They have so much power, they don't, they don't need, they feel they don't need to rationalize it. It's ridiculous. And I, I, I'm an epistemologist by training. So there is no, I can assure you, good epistemic argument for it. But here is, I think, just so that the courts don't see, I mean, obviously some of these judges, I mean, they're, some of them are intelligent and so on. So like, I will try to construct something so that it just doesn't look like complete lunacy. Um, I think part of it is this idea that you're honest in the first instance, and then you go back on the streets, right? And then you're threatened by like rival gang members, or you're threatened by, you know, like family, like family members of the person who's, who you put, whose identification you put behind bars. And so you're coerced to go back to the courts and recant. The court is so firmly convinced in its like virtue and righteousness that it doesn't realize that interrogators are doing that on the front end. 
Do you know what I mean? I really do believe that courts have historically failed to recognize that what they think rival gang members are doing on the back end, their own police detectives and interrogators are doing on the front end. And that's why I think they try to draw an asymmetry, right? They're saying, oh, recantations are they, literally courts. I mean, in my book, I have all sorts of quotes, inherently unreliable. They literally, the courts use this language. Um, I mean, I think part of it is because they have this picture where everything went well so long as they were handling it, right, on the front end. And then once the eyewitness went back to the streets, they, you know, things happened on the streets that, you know, kind of threatened them to come forward. I mean, I have a, I'm actually having lunch with him on, on Friday. I have a, a former student who was incarcerated for 30 years on the basis of a, a, a misidentification. I met him, you know, years ago in prison. And um, I mean, um, the, 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 there was one, one eyewitness and he was, uh, there were three people were shot, two were killed and he was the, the only survivor. And uh, they got an identification from him, you know, while he had been shot nine times while he was in the, the hospital room. Years later, he moved out of Chicago. He went to Texas. He became a father. He had two small children at home. He just was riddled with guilt. He put these two guys behind bars, came back and recanted. Literally, the court rejected the recantation and said, he's doing this out of gang loyalty. After he had already overtly, like, retired from the gang that he had been in. They, they, the court literally, I mean, the court couldn't see that like this person could be motivated by guilt and doing the right thing. All they could see was that there has to be some really illegitimate motive here. I mean, there was no physical evidence. Obviously my, my student was innocent. There's no physical evidence. Um, so I think that's what's operative. I mean, um, again, I'm not gonna have a good argument because there is no good argument. But when you see the reasons that the courts use for rejecting the recantation, it's you know manipulation. They're trying to manipulate the court. There's just no recognition that that could have happened on the front end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. I think we're, we're just closing. Maybe, maybe I could ask one, one question to finish off, which is, you know, on the, the picture you've you've talked about with police officers manipulating witnesses into statements that are then manipulated by prosecuting lawyers into manipulating jury jurists and jury members to um, reach a conclusion. Um, what's your level of um, confidence and faith in the jury system? Um, like the jury system as opposed to another one, or, I mean, I mean, I, I think that, you know, part of, this is not really an answer to your question, but I mean, just going back to something I said earlier, I mean, I think one of the real problems with the jury system is how much policing is done in terms of what they're able to hear and see. That's, I mean, I guess one thing that I'm just gonna, I mean, since we don't have a lot of time, I think that's one thing that I'll just highlight near the end juries need to be able to do their jobs, right? And so like, even in the Juan Rivera case, I mean, come on, like the unindicted co-ejaculator, I mean, I've got nothing to say there. But one of the things I will say is that the jurors saw a coherent confession typed up from Juan Rivera. They didn't know that it took four days to get that out of him, that he had been you know, in the room for days, that he was literally described by a psychiatric nurse as being in the middle of a psychiatric episode. He was banging his head against the wall as he was signing this. The first draft had so many incoherencies when they brought it to the state's attorney. He said, get that out of here. Go back and interrogate him again and bring me one that is coherent and consistent. They go back to the cell while Juan Rivera was on suicide watch fed him information and walked out with a signed, consistent, coherent narrative. That's what the jurors see. So like, look, I mean, I'm not saying the jury system is perfect, but what I am saying is that there are so many front end problems before what even gets in the hands of the juries that we need to deal with because juries cannot do their job when they are being handed. If I was handed and then I went in and the, her bedroom was the second on the left. How would he know that unless he was there? You don't realize as a juror that the interrogators literally feed this to them. You know, that's why, I mean, some of the reforms we've talked about, videotaping interrogations and invest, you know, from start to finish and 
having ju- let, uh, not lying to anyone, let alone juveniles, and making sure that juveniles have counsel present while they're being interrogated. I mean, there's, you know, anyway, there's so many things we could do on the front end so that jurors are better placed to do their jobs. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for answering questions so well and staying with us for the full time. Really appreciate it. Of course. Thank you so much. It was really a pleasure. Take care, everyone. And I, I'm pleased I didn't ask too many questions because most of the things I was, going to ask, I was going to ask were asked much better by people with much more expertise than me. So thank you to our audience for fantastic um, questions. Um, next month, in uh, four weeks' time, we are going to attempt to have an actual live philosopher here in the room with us, if you can imagine such a thing. Um, we're going to have uh, Professor Timothy Williamson, um, who's a professor of logic at Oxford, uh, join us to talk about how we can know things. So picking up on some of the epistemology today and taking a, a step back to the very beginning. He's going to talk about why uh, all this cogito ergo sum business from Descartes is not the place to start. And instead, we should be starting uh, with, he says, the kinds of knowledge we share with other animals. So, yeah, I'll let you ponder that. Um, four weeks time back here in person, we will also continue uh, with the lovely Robin uh, putting everything online um, for people who can't attend in person. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Jennifer. And thank you to our audience.